So our final speaker for today is Brother John Gusky, sitting beside me here. He was raised as a Seventh-day Adventist. He began studying the Bible and the writings of Sister White as a young boy. He served his church in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, starting as a deacon at the tender age of 16, gave his first sermon when he was 19, after which he became an elder in the local church. If you look at the history of Adventism, we were led predominantly by young people in those early years. He has continued to serve in the church in many capacities and devotes many hours a week to studying of scriptures and the Sabbath school lessons, preaching in different churches, and helping out here at Village Church as needed in many capacities. He works as an automotive application engineer, and when he has time, he enjoys gardening, restoring automobiles, reading, and spending time with his family. And I'd just like to add on a personal note, um, if you want a, a spiritually mature input to a Sabbath school discussion, or you want somebody to leave a week of, lead a week of prayer or a, um, a prayer meeting, um, you'll be hard-pressed to find somebody more suited than Brother John Gusky with the spiritual maturity that he brings to his spiritual responsibilities in our church. So it's with great pleasure that I hand over now to Brother John Gusky, who will lead us in our final seminar of our Religious Liberty Weekend. And before, before he stands up, one final thing. Our next Religious Liberty Sabbath and week Friday is the 12th and 13th of January next year. So please put that in your calendars, the 12th and 13th of January. We will be t focusing on very, very different topics, um, but we look forward to seeing you all then, 12th, 13th of January, 2024. And with no further ado, I'll hand over to Brother Guskin. Everyone's received a great blessing today, did they not? It's kind of hard to end it on this, though. Um, I think one of the things that I found out mostly is, is that as you listen to each one of these presentations and you see the, the intricacies of everything going on, it leads you to believe that you need to know a lot more than what you currently do. Would I be correct in saying that? When you listen to the debate that was going on between Senator Blair and um, A.T. Jones, you start looking at the responses that A.T. Jones had. And if you are like me, you're sitting there and you're saying, could I make those same responses? Could I actually defend myself right there? And whereas the scripture says that you're not supposed to take note of what you're going to say, unless you actually study and unless you actually know God, he can't bring to remembrance something that you never put in. And so it's absolutely vital that we go and we look at the scripture and we see for ourselves individually and collectively together as we study what it takes to be able to see God more fully. Because that's what this is all about. Religious liberty is what we're talking about specifically today, but it all boils back to the gospel. And I kind of cringed. I'm going to give you what the title was. You'll notice I don't, I don't really have any PowerPoints. I'm used to speaking in churches that don't really have screens, so I usually don't do PowerPoints. So if I do, I'll probably lose my way, and you'll get a lot of, uh, and no one wants to hear that. So the title today was The Linkage Between the Gospel and Religious Liberty and the Proclamation of the Three Angels' Messages. And it's fearful to say that because that basically took up the hour of my time. Uh, it's quite a long, long, long title. Before we get into the Word today, though, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Our dear, most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for the rich blessings that we receive today, the Holy Spirit pouring out through individuals, them allowing themselves to be people who will listen to you and be able to explain it in such a way that we can all understand and we can all be driven to a closer walk with you. Lord, we pray that as we go on this last topic of the day, that you will open up the scriptures to us and that you will make it very plain, that our hearts will be converted, that we will be ready for you when you return, and we will be um, foremost in making sure that others are going with us. Lord, I pray that you'll forgive me my sins. Let none of my words come out here, but only let yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So thinking about what we were going to do today, um, I think it's just going to be pretty easy. Uh, it's, it's almost getting to about 7 o'clock when we're done, so we're just going to go over something very simple today. What we're going to do is we're going to stay safe. We're going to look at some of the things that Jesus said, and then I'm going to tell you a bunch of stories. Does that sound reasonable? Now, some of you are like, I don't really know about that. That's, that's maybe not too good. I don't, I don't know if I want to hear his stories. But no, trust it, this comes from the Bible. Because I firmly believe as I study more and more that every time that God tells us something through prophecy, he gives us a demonstration of it in action somewhere else in the Scripture. So you don't need to make a mistake and you don't need to hypothesize about something and say, well, we really don't know what it is. 
you can go back into Scripture and you can look and you can see how that actually plans out. So nothing should come to you by surprise. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Jesus' words first and we're going to look at the importance of religious liberty. So the obvious place that we want to look about Jesus talking about end time events would be Matthew chapter 24 when he's sitting on the Mount of Olives, correct? Now, the disciples came up to him and he says, hey, what's the signs of all these things happening? Because remember, they saw the temple and they said, you know, Jesus, this this temple, in so many words, is going to last forever. And he says, meh, you know what? I don't really think so. In fact, there's not going to be one stone that's going to be left upon another. They are terrified. How, how's this, how, how could this be? And so they asked Jesus privately, and they said, okay, tell us the signs of these things. And in their minds, they could not get it through that the temple could be destroyed and the end of the world wouldn't be there. Those two things were linked together. Once again, it's an incorrect view of what the Scriptures actually said. So Matthew chapter 24, let's pick it back up. And and one of the speakers I really like listening to on any occasion I possibly um, could get a chance to, is his name is Randy Skeet, and he has this one saying that he says all the time, let's look at the Scriptures microscopically. Okay, well, I'm an, I'm an engineer. I like looking at things microscopically. Why not? Let's, let's tear into it. So as we look at these scriptures, we're going to do that a little bit microscopically. Now, how many of you have read Matthew chapter 24 before? All right. We got most of you and a few of you are afraid to answer because I know you did it. Let's start on verse 4. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So what's the very first thing that Jesus talks about? He talks about deception. He doesn't talk about events. He talks about your state of mind. Are you capable right now to have someone tell you a lie and you know it? You know, one of the cool things about rat poison is is that 98% of it is good food. The rat eats the food, he doesn't know it. Only in in technicality, it's 0.02% is the actual poison. So when you look at this, 0.02% is poison Can we as Christians see the 0.02%? And Jesus is saying, don't be deceived. His very first thing is not an event. Don't be deceived. That's a command. But with Jesus, all of his biddings are enablings. And so if he tells you don't be deceived, you can rest assured he's going to give you the power not to be deceived. So he continues on here. Take heed that no man deceive you, in verse 5, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, what it doesn't say is everyone's going to come and say, I am the reenactment of Jesus. It basically says that I am Christ, and Christ means the anointed one. And so when we look at the ideology going on here, Christ is actually, Jesus is saying in here that there's going to be plenty of people who say that they're anointed for something. There's something that they are going to do. You know, we could go and we could say it's a special interest group or we could say it's something else. But the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus says there's going to be people who would exercise lordship over you because they feel they're, they're anointed. So these false Christ is saying, I am Christ and shall deceive a couple. Okay, many, good. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, here's where Jesus is going to start defining the wars, and this is where we start looking at the microscope. Maybe we put it on 10x. Um, let, let's work our way up to 50x, though, okay? Does that sound fair? Here's what happens. For nations shall rise against nation. Now, Elder Bowman talked about the nations and the national part of it. And I'm, going to, I'm going to pull from everyone's talk today um, because that's kind of what you have to do. So we have this national thing, and these, these nations are actually separate people. Okay, they're, they're separate ideas of running and so forth. And if you look at the Greek word, it's, it's ethnos. And, and, and what does that sound like to you? Yeah, it sounds like something like ethnic. In other words, an ethnic is like a different set of people, if you would. It doesn't have to be by color. It doesn't have to be by language. It doesn't have to be one set. But what it does indicate is, is that there's a separation. And so nation will rise against nation. During the time of the papal rule through the 1260 years, we had fighting amongst nations. But was there a unified government? Yeah. But this time here, there's nation against nation. 
And then finally he goes and he says there would be kingdom against kingdom. So I got very interested about that word kingdom because we normally think about it as, okay, this king is fighting against this king. But specifically, 55 times in the book of Matthew alone, kingdom is used by Christ. And each time it's talking about the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Caesar. And so when Jesus is saying that kingdom will rise against kingdom, what would be the conclusion that you would say by the context of Matthew? Is that he's talking about his kingdom is going to war against Satan's kingdom. And we know this to be true through Revelation and through Daniel, that the kingdom will rise against kingdom. The nations are now angry and they're fighting against each other. This tells us right now that this is after the 1260 years. This is the time period where people need to understand something. And Jesus is laying out what's going to go on. Let's pick it back up here in verse 8. I'm sorry. Verse 7, let's continue on there again. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Let's go ahead and really look at these signs. How many signs did Jesus give of the end time here? Yeah, three. Someone said three from the audience. Yeah, there's three of them, right? Right, so what was there? There was famines, pestilences, earthquakes. Okay, let's go ahead and review these. Can man create a famine? Yeah. If you listen to the news right now, what is the reason for places not getting rain? Well, it's, it's climate change because we have a carbon footprint. And so since we have this carbon footprint, the, the, the patterns are changing. If we eliminate the carbon footprint through the 15-minute cities, if we eliminate everything else like that, guess what we could reverse? Well, we could reverse those things, right? So this is a very, very man-centered reaction. Man can change us. It's an awful lot like when Moses comes in there and he throws a serpent down. I, I'm sorry, he didn't throw a serpent down. He picked it up. When Moses goes ahead and throws his rod down on the ground and turns into the serpent, what did the Egyptian magicians do? They fooled Pharaoh into thinking that they could do the same thing. And, of course, Moses' rod went and swallowed up all their rods. He picked it up, and now Moses has 10, 15 rods in his hand. It doesn't really matter. They were all indigenous to his rod now. Okay, why? Because his rod was better, uh, because God told him to do it. So in here, we see the same concept again, that the Egyptian magicians could do the things that God actually put in. When we read the book of Hebrews, we see that the earth is old and it needs to be changed like a raiment. Is the earth changing? Is the earth wearing out? And ultimately, should you take care of the earth? Yeah, because it's God's. You're not going to abuse something that God gave you, at least you shouldn't. But the rationale could be made human. That's number one. How about pestilences? We heard many things about this right now. As a matter of fact, we just had a huge pestilence, did we not? And so I don't really need to go too much further on there, but can man solve the problem to pestilence? Absolutely. If everyone is mandated to get that vaccine, you can solve that, pe you can solve that pestilence. You can solve it. It's science, right? Science. Science. I'll say it one more time. So as a result of this, that's another man-made thing. Oh, but this last one. Ooh, what are we going to do with that? Earthquakes. Now, I have yet to see, and I, I do like science. It's part of my job. Okay, I like science. I have not seen any scientific evidence showing that if you start working on getting rid of excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that you could prevent an earthquake from happening. There is nothing that man can do that causes or prevents earthquakes that we know of. The same for volcanoes. And guess what we're getting a lot more of? Even in Southern California, they just had a tropical storm that came through, and they had a 5.2 earthquake at the same time. Okay, did the tropical storm cause the earthquake? Well, no. The earthquake happened because the plate tectonics decided to shift. There is friction, and it happens. Okay, so the earthquake, well, what would cause an earthquake? Well, possibly displeasure of God on us because God is going to give you that. Do you remember, what was the hurricane that went through New Orleans? Yeah, Katrina, do you remember the commentary on that, that God was displeased 
with um, New Orleans. So therefore, he smote them with a hurricane. Do you, does any of you remember that? Yeah, I remember that quite easily. We have a tendency to do things like insurances will say act of God. And we use these natural disasters to say like God's really disappointed. So as we look at this end time we come up with, we start seeing that there's this opportunity with these signs for people to influence the way you think. And so that's why Jesus starts off very first saying, be not deceived. These three signs that he gave you were signs that will show you what the general attitude of the people will be and what the mind process will be. Everyone wants to be safe, right? Everyone wants to take care of the planet that they live on. No one wants to drive, you you know, someone's driving down the road right in front of your house and they dump their garbage there. You'd say, hey, that's not right, wouldn't you? And so we always look at these things and we say, this is the right thing to do. This is the right way to go. And so the deception is always following when we look at this from a human standpoint. And then we start applying human laws to be able to make these things change. Let's continue on again. He says, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall all many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. So during this time of persecution or during this time of deception, we see that persecution arises. And persecution arises toward God's people. You're not with the program. You're not complying. You're not going according to the latest thing that we say that you have to do. You believe that you should have freedom of conscience only answerable to God. And if you're only answerable to God, you are a good citizen. Because when you answer to God, you not only answer the first four commandments, but you do the second six as well. And so therefore, the civil authorities are not a terror unto you. Because anything that they could say a law to protect your neighbor, you already do it. Because you love them, right? And so there's not this issue where you are a bad citizen. But yet people are going to hate you because you're not with the latest plan. So this really gets kind of, kind of convoluted. So we look at that a little bit closer. And many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. So this is necessary to keep it going. If you are a true believer of God and you can demonstrate true religious freedom in what goes on, what has to happen in order to squash your testimony? False prophets, false doctrines need to be promoted even more. And that's what we're seeing here. And because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. There was a time several, several years ago that maybe one of you and I could have a difference of opinions, and we could discuss that. And I could say, you know what, I really don't necessarily agree with what you're saying. And you could say, John, you know what, I don't agree with you either. And we could say, okay. And we could walk away from there, and I could say, yeah, um, he doesn't agree with me, but that's okay. And they could say, well, I don't agree with him, and that's okay. Those times are long gone. Now, if you don't agree with someone, there's usually something that you go on social media or there's something that you do straight outright to say that this person is basically useless because they don't see things the way that I do. There's been a polarization that we have going on, not only from a political standpoint, from just a general human-to-human -human standpoint that has gotten a lot worse. And you have to see that every single day. No one could just say like, hey, I really don't see that, and that's all right. So it keeps on getting worse. The love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So I looked up that word endured, and I checked it out in other places in the Bible. And basically what it says is that you have this multitude of trials that are coming your way. And as these trials come your way, what Jesus says the same shall be saved if you endure all those trials to the end. Well, that's good news. We have two books in the Bible that are very important to us these last days, one of which is Daniel, of which we'll talk about a little bit later, but the other of which is Job. 
Because Job basically shows you the great controversy laid out. It demonstrates to you a method in which Jesus gives the opportunity for us to participate in his character transformation, where Satan can come up and accuse the brethren, i.e. Job here, and in that case, he says, have you considered my servant Job? Did Satan go to pick the fight against Job? No, God volunteered Job in the battle. And he says, Job isn't going to cave. And Satan's like, oh, (laughs) I, I got him. He's gone too. And sure enough, he didn't cave. And so God is able to show what he can do with a person. When you think about this, who is the audience in the book of Job? It was those people who have not fallen. Because remember, it was the council together with the sons of God, and Satan was amongst them. So the people who actually saw them was going to be Job's neighbor once the Lord came the second time. And when you think about this, here you have all these angels, you have all these other beings that have never fallen, and you look at them, and you have to have some pity on them because God goes up to them and he says, I could take those people on earth and I can change them and transform them, and they're going to live next to you forever. And that angel remembers what you were like the first time he came here to try to protect you. And he's saying, you know what, God? I'm not so sure about this one. And Jesus says, trust me. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, we got him. And he keeps on working in him. Finally, the angel would say, you're right, Lord. I can't wait until he or she comes to heaven because I would like to spend the rest of eternity with them. That's what Jesus does for us. To me, I, I find that so impossible to believe. Knowing where we are at, knowing what we are doing right now, and knowing where God can and will take us if we will only let him, it's astounding. It's just astounding. And so Jesus goes on a little bit further, and he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. So what's going to be preached to all nations? The gospel. Okay. So this is where the three angels' messages come in. Now, we studied the three angels' messages last quarter, did we not, in Sabbath school? So I'm not going to go through each one of those word by word by word by word, other than to say that I believe that there's a place in the Old Testament that we can see these three angels' messages played out. That's what we're going to go to. But before we go there, Jesus makes something very interesting right here. In verse 15, he says, When therefore you shall see the abomination and desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. And so here we see Jesus actually referencing the book of Daniel. How should we look at the book of Daniel? Let's go ahead and turn over here to Revelation. It's funny, we're going to Revelation to look at the book of Daniel, but we're going to go to Revelation chapter 10. So please go ahead and, there's pew Bibles in front of you if you want to grab one of those. Let's go ahead and look at this. And I found out when you read it, it cements it in a little bit more. Daniel chapter, I'm sorry, it's not Daniel chapter 10, it's Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. And what we're going to do is start in verse 5. We're going to go 5 and we're going to go all the way to 11. And I promise you I'll break a little bit in there. But Revelation chapter 10, verse Five. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. And this is fascinating because when we look at Revelation chapter 13, we see two beasts coming up out of the, uh, onto the scene, if you would. One comes up from where? Well, it comes up from the water, the first one, called the sea beast. And then the second one comes from where? Well, the land, which is the land beast. Okay, and so we have these two beasts that are coming up, and yet this angel is standing upon the sea, and upon the earth. And he lifted his hand up to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. So in here, this angel who's standing there on the earth and on the sea is saying, no more time. In other words, all time prophecies are over at this time. So now we're living in that day of antitypical day of atonement. There's no time prophecies afterwards. And Then he says in verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, which is the last one, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared unto the servants the prophets. Now this could turn into 
from this normal little discourse that we're doing here, this could turn into the everlasting gospel if I hit every detail here. And I'm not going to do that to you because you've been here a long time already, and to hear me go on for another four hours just would not be good. But suffice it to say that right now, as we look at this, we see that the mystery of God should be finished. Now, this should start sending up your antenna saying that there's something that God is going to do for his church. And when we look at righteousness by faith, is that not what God is going to do for his church? See, when we look at righteousness and so forth, a lot of the times we have a tendency, and it's universal. It's not just the churches out there. It's our church as well. We have a tendency to look at it and say, you know what, God has high standards, so I need to and then fill in the blank. Can you ever do that? Can, can you ever reach to God's high standards on your own? And, and the thought would be that if you really think about it logically, if you could reach to God's standards on the own, then that means that Christ's sacrifice was not really sufficient on its own. It needed the sacrifice and something else from you. That's simply not the case. It only needed the sacrifice of Christ. Now, you have an active participation in that, because you have this. We'll get back into that other point later. But needless to say, the mystery of God should be finished. So we have the mystery of godliness. We have the mystery of iniquity. They're both coming to a head right now. The mystery of godliness is how you can actually look like God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we see this through Paul's writings, and we see it throughout the Old Testament even, that there is a work that God is going to do to his people when they allow him to do it. You don't have to worry about this. God is going to take care of you. He is going to make sure that you are going to go to heaven. But you have to submit everything. We're going to talk about one of our favorite people to show how this actually works. So in verse 8, it says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. So we're halfway through right now, and I can't tell you everything about this little book, but this is the book of Daniel. And it's what? Well, it's open. And the angel says, go ahead and take that book that's open, and you're going to do something to it. You're going to take it, and you're going to eat it. And so, in verse 9, he says, I went to the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Well, this is fascinating. So he eats this little book. So who is eating the little book? Well, it's John. And who wrote Revelation? John. And so when you eat this book, what happens? Did he take the book, eat it, got in his belly bitter, he had indigestion, and then he threw it back up? No. It actually went in his system, and it stayed in his system. You know, you ever think about this When you think of communion and you think about what the Lord was doing there, he says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do it in remembrance of me. And so you're actually, it's not not transubstantiation. It's not that at all. But the, the figurative language there is that when you eat Christ, he becomes part of you. In other words, you don't just go and say, I can casually eat and I go back to what I was doing. When you eat, you actually take him on and you say, what you have needs to course through my veins and it needs to change me into what I am not. The saying has always been, you are what you eat, right? You've heard that before. So I like growing things. That was in my bio, so evidently it's true. So I like growing things and I like growing corn. So if I ate corn before I came here today, would I be yellow or white with sprouts on? The fact of the matter is, no, I would not. I'd still look the same. But if I eat junk food all the time like donuts, would I look like a donut? Chances are, yeah, I've probably got a life preserver. You know, it's probably not a good thing for me. So by eating healthy, you become healthy. By eating junky, junkily, or let's make up that word for today. That's good. We're all tired. If you eat junk food, you end up having your health diminish. Now, if you eat Christ you have a tendency to be like Christ. 
So when John is eating this book of Daniel and he's ingesting it in, he's showing that Daniel and Revelation are sister books. They go together. When you read one, you need to read the other. When you read the other, you need to read the one. And you go back and forth. These books are linked. And so that becomes part of them. And so when you read the book of Daniel, what do you get? You get God's plan throughout history. You get it, you understand it, but you also get Christ as our mediator. You also get Christ coming to earth. You also get his work in the sanctuary totally. And then you finally get to the book, of, you get to the end of the book, and you get Daniel chapter 11, of which we don't have every single answer for yet. But all that is given as you eat that book. It now becomes part of you. What's the significance of that? Verse 11, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings and kings. So have you ever heard of nations, kindreds, and tongues before? Maybe once or twice? Well, yeah, it's part of the three angels' message. And the first angel came down, right? And he had a message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And so we see that same group of people there. But notice there's someone else thrown in here, which is kings. So if you picked up what was going on today, there was an awful lot of testimony about religious liberty to whom? to the civil powers, to religious liberties. Through the study of the book of Daniel, you were to get a much better insight into how to defend your faith, not only amongst the nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, but before kings. So this is required reading. In fact, I would say it's required ingestion. You should be taking in the book of Daniel and learning it. This is vital to your Christian walk. I cannot overstate that. It's absolutely vital. We need to understand it. It needs to be something that goes through our minds all the time. So when you're just casually sitting around instead of thinking about, you know, what you might eat later on that day, how about giving God a chance and maybe thinking about what the little horn would be doing? Um, Why not give that a chance? But in order to know that, you have to read it all the time. Okay, so we start seeing this there that you must prophesy yet again. Now, one thing that that Revelation does is it's kind of, The the structure of it, I know, is a chiastic structure, but let's make it a very little bit simpler. If you have a wave coming into the shore and it starts cresting, the crest is the main part of the wave, right? And then it kind of goes underneath and loops back. Well, John does this an awful lot with his writings where he goes and he gives you the crest of where it's at, but then he's going to say, here's how we got there. And in this case, he goes to Daniel chapter 11, and he talks about how we got here. He talks about the beast from the bottomless pit coming up. And let's go over there to verse, um, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that descendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall be in the streets of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And I just want to point out something right here. The two witnesses were, you know, a lot of times we say the Old and the New Testament, and we look at it as total scripture, and it was killed. But notice what happened there. It was called, which is spiritually called, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So Sodom was known for, well, secularism at the best. Okay, I'm giving them a, 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 a nice construct there and just say it was that. Egypt was basically known for, who is God that I should let you go? Defiance, also sin. But where was our Lord crucified? Was it Pilate who wanted to crucify the Lord, or was it the religious people who wanted to crucify the Lord? And so now we look at this and we say, who actually killed the scriptures? False religion, secularism, and defiance to God. And so we look at this, and that's what actually killed the Scriptures. Now, in verse 9, it says, And they of the people of the kindreds, tongues, and nations. Well, here they are again. Here's the same group of people. And they shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. So they're looking at it, and they're trying to make a decision. What should we do about this? We're not doing anything because we don't know what to do. Now, Pastor Kelly referenced, I believe it was Pastor Kelly in his sermon, about that we somewhat have a tendency to forget that the witness is part of it, a part of the, of the language. And so do we have a sufficient witness for the nations, kindreds, time, tribes, and people to see and to be converted? Is our witness strong? 
Did we eat the book of Daniel and do we live the book? If we do, then we have a strong witness. So there's another group of people that we find in verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And so these people that dwell upon the earth, you're going to find them again in Revelation chapter 13. They're the ones who make the image to the beast. And you can look at this as these two groups. One is in the valley of decision. They're wondering what is right and what is wrong. They're looking at the evidence upon them. And the second part is giving gifts to each other. And I want to point out something right here is that God gives gifts as well. What is God's gift to you? Well, it's the Holy Spirit. That's the greatest gift that he could pour out to you right now. And he says, it's expedient for me to go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit can't come. And the Holy Spirit is your surety. Basically, he's your down payment. He basically says, I got them. I'm going to make sure that they get home. And he works on you and he converts you. And he, he, he continually gets to your conscience, does he not? And he says, you really don't want to do that. You'd really rather do this. Has anyone had that experience? This is the work of the Holy Spirit. But notice, these people that dwell on the earth give another gift. What's the gift that they give? It's known as the guillotine because it's going to control your conscience as well. In this case here, they were able to get people to do what they want to because of fear, coercion, everything else that we were talking about. But the gift that God gives is the gift of the Holy Spirit because he's here to convert us. So let's continue on here again. We see that those two groups of people exist, and we see them all the way into uh, Revelation chapter 13. But how should we live in these last days? We're going to close it up with this. Okay, we're, we're getting out of time here real fast. Uh, let's go to the three angels' message, okay? The three angels' messages. Uh, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 18. And I mentioned to you that we're going to tell stories. And this is the first one that we're going to look at, Revelation chapter 18. And I like to call this the revelation, or I like to call this the three angels of Genesis. Because in here we have this going on. In verse 1, it says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door of the heat of the day. So who appeared to him? Well, the Lord. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, I know if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Yet a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And so now he's got these three beings that he welcomes in. And he says, If I have found favor in your sight, stay with me. Did they stay with him? Here's the good part about it. God finds favor with you too. And he will stay with you. All you have to do is ask, as Abraham asked, and be serious about it. He was really in on this. He says, come on here. under you know, Why travel all this way? I'll give you food. I'll give you water. I'll give you everything you need. Stay with me. And they're saying, yeah, okay, we'll do it. And one of them was who? Well, the Lord. So now we get into like verse 9, and they said, you know what? Here's what we're going to do for you. Sarah's going to have a son. And of course, Sarah laughed. We won't get into the details on there. But the first thing that happened was they promised the son. Okay, this is very important. They promised the son to him. And then it goes on into one of my favorite parts in the Bible, verse 16. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom. But Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And this is insight into how the Lord thinks. This is why this is so cool. The Lord is having a conversation with himself, no one else. And he's saying, should I hide this thing from Abraham? And so he starts on this with more. And the Lord said, or seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. And the Lord might bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of, uh, spoken of him. Again, this is fascinating. The Lord is saying that he knows Abraham. You can bring it to present day. Does the Lord know you? Does he know that you're going to command your house in such a way that it would bring honor and glory, that it would be the, the glory of all nations? Can he say that about us? He could say it about Abraham. In fact, he had the conversation to prove that he could say it about Abraham. But the cool thing about this is, as we look a little bit more, he talks about his family and that he would order his family. 
several chapters later in chapter 22, we see that Abraham is put to the test. And this is very important because when God addresses Abraham, he says, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and then take him to a mountain of which I will tell thee. And those are the mountains in Moriah, right? And he says he would offer him there for a sacrifice. And so God told him to do something that just didn't seem right to him. But notice what he says, take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. And at the end, after God stayed his hand from slaying Isaac, he said, now I know that you love me because you have not withholden your son, your only son. He left off whom thou lovest. That was not part of the conversation of God because Abraham actually got to the point of where he loved God more than he loved the gifts that God gave him. This is vital because this has to be what happens to us. We cannot order our lives and depend fully on God unless we love God supremely. Adam's mistake was he loved Eve more than he loved God. Eve's mistake was is that she loved the idea of learning something more about God than actually being with God. You know, the, the, the serpent deceived her, and Adam went on volition. But the fact of the matter is they both had a diminished love of God that would have kept them safe had they had more. So when we look at this about God saying that Abraham was going to give his household everything that was necessary in order to be able to be a blessing to all nations, we have that story. And later on, when um, Jacob met with Laban, remember Laban, Jacob was fleeing because Laban changes his things 10 times and he was getting out of there. It was time for him to go. The angel told him to go. And when he's fleeing away, finally Laban goes up to him and he says, Jacob, here's what it's going to be. You took my daughter, you took my grandkids, you took my cows, but we're going to set up the stone right here. I'm not going to cross over it to you. You're not going to cross over it to me for anything evil. And swear by the God of your father Abraham and of Terah. And he wouldn't do it. He says, I'm not, I'm, I'm, no, 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 I'm not doing that. I'm going to swear by the fear of Isaac. Because at that moment, Jacob actually realized that the fear of Isaac was actually Isaac surrendering all to the father. And he says, this is something I can live by. This is something I can do. There's no ecumenicalism there. The gods of Terah was not the God of Abraham. They had those idols. And in this case, Laban's trying to blend them together to get a good blessing on their family. And Jacob's having none of it. He's saying, I know what a true family looks like, the family of God. That's not it. I'm only going to swear by those things that I know of. And so now we look at this and we can say that Abraham started this this whole entire idea of total trust and belief in God, which is why he's the father of all faithful. When we look at that, he put God supremely, and he didn't stagger at the promise anymore. The good news is that Abraham made mistakes, and each mistake he realized it was a mistake, and he kept on growing in grace with God. And so he got to the point of where God could put him on trial, and he would pass. Do you think the trial that Abraham went through was harder than the fruit in the Garden of Eden? Abraham passed it in a very fallen condition. That's what the power of God can do in you. That's what it can do. So when you talk about religious liberty, that's awesome because you get to choose a God who can make you like him. Like him, not him. But he can change your character. He can make you better. I talk an awful lot about restoring cars. That's one of my favorite things to do. I don't get time to do it, but I like doing it. And the best analogy I can give you is, is that I go and I, there's this car when I go to visit some of our friend's house. It's way off in the back, and of course I spotted it. Uh, the very first car I had was a 76 Trans Am, and I love that car. But anyway, it got totaled. Not by me. But anyway, it got totaled, and I was always saying, I'd like to have that car back. So as I was driving down the road, I saw it. It's at least 200 yards off the road. And I saw this orange car, the fender of it back there. And I go to Stacy, my wife, and I'm like, babe, that's a Firebird. I can make that a Trans Am. You know, and, I, and she's like, huh, what? I'm like, yeah, it's, it's way back there. And so I'm looking at this. I'm saying, I know what I could do to that. And you could just picture God going up to it and saying like, you know, here's this rusty human right here. This has no value, none whatsoever. No one who looks at that human says there's any value there. Even this church says there's no value in that person, but God does. 
And so God looks at that person and he says, hey, I could do something with it. And God has all the skills to where he can cut out the rusty metal, weld in the sheet metal, where he could go ahead and take that engine and make it better than what it was new. And he could go ahead and make the body straight so it didn't have any lines. And he could get everything on it perfect, new transmission, the interior new. And then he takes it to this little show out there, and everyone marvels at how good this thing looks. Shows a picture before, shows a picture after. That's what God does with us. He is the master restorer who can take us from something that was rusty where everyone would say you should discard it. And he says, oh no, I can bring it back. That's what he does with us. So how do we look at things? We're going to close with this one, one additional story. Please bear with me. Um, And this one is going to be interesting. Several chapters earlier, I believe it's in chapter 14, uh, Lot is captured. He's captured by the kings. Okay, it was four against five. uh, And before that, I think it was for 18 years, Sodom and Gomorrah were in captivity to these other kings, and they finally rose up against them. And they finally said, enough, we're not going to pay tribute to these kings anymore. The other kings came down and said, oh, yes, you will. So the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah flee, and they capture Lot. And so Abraham says, you know what? 318 of you guys who trained, you're going to come with me. We're going to take them back. And so Abraham takes these people back. And because Abraham went and did this, he got to meet up with Melchizedek. And we all know what happens there. Melchizedek is a representative of what Christ is like. Abraham gives tithes of all. He shows all these things. And yet now, in this story that we're looking at in chapter 18, after Jesus tells him basically, I come down here to see for myself if the wickedness of these cities is so great that I need to destroy them. He starts rationally talking to God saying, hey, you know what? You're the God of the universe. I know who you are. You're not going to destroy the wicked with the, you're not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. So if there's 50, you won't do it, will you? No. 45? No. 30? 20? 10? He finally gets down to 10, and he says, no, I won't destroy him for that. Abraham's satisfied. These are the people who Abraham basically freed. These are people that were those that dwell upon the earth. Because how do we know that? Abraham was praying for people up until the very end. When we look at the three angels' messages, it's so easy for us to say it's us versus them, or it's them out there. Abraham took an active role in saying, Lord, I'm in this with you. You love them, and because you love me, I love them as well. I'm not willing that they suffer and die, but if they do, I understand why. But in the meantime, let's save them. Lot's there with his family. I think I can wrangle up 10, and we could keep them alive a little bit longer, and maybe they will see. Maybe the witness that we have will change them. In these last days, as we look at the three angels' messages, we need to look at it from the sense of how Abraham did it. These are all children of God. Each person that was born, he knew from the very beginning. Each one of these people who you see on the earth that you have no idea who they were, God actually had a spot in his mind and a place in heaven that they could have been. And it doesn't really matter what we think of them. That's where they could have been. It's on us to really take God at his word and to look at it and say, God, your ways are perfect. They're far above mine. Whatever it is that you would have me to do, Lord, that is what I will do. I will not question. I will go forward. Because you first love me, I will love you. And when we look at this, how do we get there? We can only get there through studying of the Scripture. We're going to talk about marriage this week in our Sabbath school class. Um, next Sabbath, I believe it is. And as we look at that, husbands and wives, if all of a sudden I went to my wife, Stacy, and I said, hey, babe, this is before, and I said, let's get married. And she says, okay, that's a great idea. And we get married. And then, you know, after the wedding, you know, we spend about a month together, and then I just kind of do my thing, and she kind of does her thing. Is that a marriage? By paper, it is. But by practice, is it a marriage? No. The way that we learn more about our spouse and the way we love our spouse more is by spending more time with them. We're in different situations. I come home from from work one day and she says, you know what? I backed into something and it totally ruined the car. Oh, I I just spent four years restoring that. Well, that's that's no bueno. That's not good. Um, Yeah. Well, what's my reaction to her? Do I love her more than I love the car? 
Oh, I better. I better. But I spent four years with that car. Yeah. So what? So what? I spent more time with my wife, and I love her more than anything else down here. That's the lesson that we learned from Abraham. He was promised a son for 25 years, finally gets this son. God says this son is going to bring the promised Messiah through. By the way, kill him. And Abraham says, I know. I know that your word is true. Regardless of what I see, you're going to make this happen. If you say it, I believe you and I love you enough that you will continue to make it happen. That's where we need to be. That's where he's asking us to be. That's the only way how we have true love for everyone who's out there in this world, to actually bring them in. Will everyone come to see the Lord? No. Will everyone decide to see the Lord? No. The Bible's very clear on that. But there's no reason why we should stop praying and stop loving and stop trying to get these people that God designated to be alive in the kingdom with him. So I'd encourage you each and every day, spend time in the scriptures. Look at things microscopically. Look how God has worked in the past with you. Look at what God gives you through that freedom. Look at how he actually shows you love each and every day. He reigns on the just and he reigns on the unjust. He reigns on both of them. Let us always have a word within our mouth to bring comfort to someone, even if at some point in our life we figured they did not deserve it. I need to close the prayer. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I got them both here, so now this is better authority. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many things you've given to us. Lord, we love you so much. But we pray that we'll be able to love you more. We pray that we'll be able to take these Sabbath days that we have. We're talking about religious liberty, and, and it goes beyond the Sabbath, but Lord, this is kind of right in our minds all the time because we do honor your day. We pray that we'll be able to honor it more and more each day. Very much so, the Sabbath, the sun will be going down shortly. May we be able to look forward to next week's Sabbath already and say truly it's a much better day when the Sabbath arrives than anything that could happen during the week. Lord, we love you and we pray that we'll be more like you always. Be with everyone here who's come from distances. We pray that you'll keep them safe on their way home. And we thank you for everyone who is able to participate today. On the same thing we ask in Jesus' name we pray, amen.